Uh, the book is titled David and Goliath, Underdogs, Misfits, and the Art of Battling Giants. The David and Goliath story has been with us for millennia. You write that we've been telling the story wrong. In what way? We have overestimated David's uh, disadvantages. We've made him out to be this underdog who wins this improbable victory. But I think if you look closely at the story, you realize he's a lot more powerful than he seems. Um, he has superior technology. I mean, the sling that he has is one of the most devastating weapons in ancient times. Um, it has a stopping power equivalent to a 45 caliber handgun. Um, Goliath, there's all this really fascinating speculation about whether he has a medical condition called acromegaly, which would render him, uh, he, he seems to have s problems with his eyesight. There's all kinds of clues in the biblical text that suggest he's not seeing what's going on around him. Um, and then we have the fact that David is filled with the Spirit of the Lord, right? So you've got a kid with powerful technology facing a big, lumbering, half-blind giant weighed down with armor. He's changed the rules without telling his opponent, and he's filled with the Spirit of the Lord. Well, how is he the underdog, right? It doesn't. My point is in telling that story is that uh, that way is I think when we insist on calling David an underdog, what we do is we belittle all of the those particular kinds of um, uh, strengths and gifts that he had, right? And we persist in this um, misapprehension that says that if you're powerful and big, um, then that's all that matters. Um, in fact, this, you know, the things that make up for, uh, for a, a winning combination in the world aren't about size and power. They're about a whole bunch of other things. What got you thinking about the advantages of disadvantages? Because I, in my last book, Outliers, I had interviewed lots and lots of very successful people, and I, every time I interviewed someone who had achieved something in the world, they, when they told their story, they would always start with an account of the things that had gone wrong and the obstacles they faced. And I never, I didn't sort of register with me until after that book was done that, like, that's really interesting. Why do they always start with what, with the hard parts? And then I realized, well, maybe the hard parts are the point, you know, and that's sort of what got me um, on thinking about this book. Mm. You write a lot about something you're calling uh, desirable difficulties. Um, and a as a case in point, dyslexia, you mm. point to the many people who are very su successful who have dyslexia. We're talking Charles Schwab, we're talking uh, billionaire Richard Branson. Mm. Um, and, and yet some of the critics say, well, those are the outliers. They're the exception to the rule. The, the vast majority of people with dyslexia truly are disadvantaged. So how do you respond to that kind yeah. of criticism? Um, well, listen, the critics would say that. It's, I'm the one who says that. I make that point in my chapter that very clearly that most people who have dyslexia, it's not a desirable difficulty, as I, that's, I use that phrase. Um, but the point of the chapter is to say there are two ways in which people respond to adversity. Um, one is for it to be a genuine setback, and in the case of dyslexia, that's plainly the case. I mean, I make the point in the book that if you go to every prison in the world, you will find a hugely disproportionate number of dyslexics. Um, it's a serious disability, but we shouldn't let that fact blind us to the fact that a small number of people manage to make something of it and to succeed not in spite of their dyslexia, but because of it. And I think it's crucial to try and figure out why is this difficulty desirable for some and undesirable for others? If we can figure that out, we can learn how to help those for whom dyslexia is an overwhelming disadvantage. But do you have to have uh, a horrible childhood in order to succeed. I mean, w what is the underlying message that you're trying to convey? Do we all need to be searching out how we are disadvantaged and turn that around? Or can the rich kid's child succeed uh, despite his advantages? No, I think what all I'm trying to do in this book is to prompt a more sophisticated discussion about what helps and what doesn't. And how we how do we make sense of the hands that life deals us? Um, it's not about trying to game the system to line up the maximum number of advantages on your side, um, but it's understanding. So, for example, I have a chapter where I talk about um, class size. Um, 
it, we operate under an assumption in this country that the smaller a class is, the better off students are. That's not true. Um, that's a very unsophisticated understanding about what advantage means in the stand in the, in the classroom. And so what I try and do is say, look, a little bit of adversity, um, having to work out something by yourself without a teacher hovering over your shoulder, turns out to not be a bad thing for students. Too much is a bad thing, but there is such a thing as the right amount of struggle in a classroom. That's the kind of much more sophisticated discussion we ought to be having. And that's what I'm trying to prompt with this book. We need to get away from, I think, these simplistic accounts of um, the kinds of things that make us better off. So you're not a David? Oh, I don't really know whether I'm a David or I don't, th I don't think that I slot into this book. I'm a Canadian, so I'm sort of, I suppose I'm, I'm kind of an underdog in that sense, but that's about it. Malcolm Gladwell, thank you so much for the time. Thank you.